Of course, mainly Jonathan and Lindsay and Noah are out today on vacation, and that's much needed, and that's great. But it simply means some things. It means that we're, we're not on, online today, live, going on. I think they are able to film the service, so it will be on our Facebook site later, but the people who join us uh, live will not be able to be joining us by their worship service today, unless right at the last minute the Lord does something and uh, brings a miracle about uh, that, that won't be happening today. But you're here, and we're so glad you're here. Good to see you this morning. It's great to be here. I'm Mike Dawson, and I'm serving as the transitional interim pastor here today, and uh, good, good to have guests with us this morning. Two, two of our guests are from Lewisburg, and uh, one of them is a longtime friend of mine. His name is Chuck Coble. Chuck, would you wave at us right here, right up on the front row? He's up there on, on, right at the front, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's the amen row, by the way, you, you guys. A, a friend of his throughout uh, their years is with him, and that's Chris Rogers. Chris, would you wave at us? Glad, glad to have uh, both Chuck and Chris visiting with us this morning, uh, and that's just a, a great thing. Been uh, had the opportunity to serve at Farmington uh, Baptist Church in Lewisburg, and that's where Chuck and his family are very actively involved. And so I got to know Chuck uh, during that particular time, and he had been saying that uh, there's going to be an opportunity to come and drop in on us, and he and Chris were involved in a, in a, a golf weekend, and so this morning gave them an opportunity. Everybody else was clearing out, and they came on here to, to Dalewood today. Chris and Chuck, we're so glad to have you all with us. We've got some people back today, too. William Weaver is back this morning. William visited with us for the first time last Sunday, and uh, William, we're delighted to have you uh, back with us again today. And we have others who have been out a while and are back, and that's great news. We're uh, delighted to see you. Uh, and t today, now at the end of the service, I'll mention some important things, but let me just go ahead and say one important one that you want to be sure not to miss hearing me say is that there will be a call business meeting of Dalewood Church on May 7th. That will be two weeks from today uh, to consider a bid on the sale of the, uh, the mission house uh, next, next door. And uh, so please keep that in mind and uh, re remember that. I'll mention it again at the end of the worship service just so you could uh, know, know about that. But that would be two weeks from today, May the 7th, call business meeting after, after church, just for uh, a quick uh, matter of that. We're glad you're here. Good to see you. And uh, we're glad to welcome today Mark Campbell. Mark is filling in to lead our worship for Jonathan and Lindsay. And Steffi is back with us today, so we at least have one person representing the praise uh, team that we know and uh, is with us. Uh, but Mark, come on up, and Steffi, come on up, and uh, begin leading us this morning as we worship together. Uh, we are delighted to see every one of you here this morning, and uh, join in the worship. If you know the words... And the song, sing it. If you don't know the words in the song, just read them off of this screen. Uh, we, they've been trying diligently to get the other screen going, but as of a couple of minutes ago, that was not happening. So you'll have to look in this direction uh, to see the hymn book today and uh, read those words and join in the worship. Would you all welcome Mark with us today? All right. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, a good thing is that we don't serve a God of sound systems. We do serve a God of glory and a God of spirit and truth. So we will worship in that way this morning. Amen. Here we go. let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. 
He has done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break them the chains. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm. You've been faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You have done great things. You have done great things. O oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. And hallelujah, God, above it all, hallelujah, God unshakable hallelujah you have done great things hallelujah god above it all hallelujah god unshakable hallelujah you have done great things have done great things Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And there of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit and washed in His blood. And this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of 
love. And this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. And this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior. Am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. Filled with His goodness. Filled with His goodness, and washed in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long, and this is my story, this is my song. my Savior all the day. Sing that chorus one more time. And this, this is, is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. And all God's people said, Amen. Jesus Christ. This is your story. This is your song. And how we rejoice in it. And thank you, Mark, for leading us today and Stephanie for being there on percussion. You've come to God's house today and more than likely you've come with some request on your heart, on your mind. Maybe there's a relative, maybe there's a neighbor, maybe there's a co-worker or a friend standing in need of prayer. When we come together on Wednesdays for prayer meeting, we have a long list of things, table talk. If you did not pick one of those up, you can get one today. You see some families in our congregation who've been through grief recently, some who have relatives that are having medical and health problems, and some of you are going through some things uh, today. So it's good that we can come together, people and pastor pray together. Would you bow with me, please, as we... With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, I know that uh, there are probably several of you who would say, Brother Mike, here is something that's on my mind today, my heart. I really want you to pray with me about it. Well, the good thing is I can pray with you about it. In many cases, I, I will know probably what your request is. There are some I know that are private and personal, and I may not know about it, but The Lord knows. And so what I'd like to do is just join with you in prayer today and with others not looking around, but with me looking. If there's a particular request that you would have this morning that you'd love for me to pray with you about, would you quietly just stand to your feet just for a moment? I'll take a moment, look around and see you.
Listen, I see on both sides several of us standing today. Now I'm looking, I know you by name. And in many cases, I know what might be on your heart. I may not know for sure. I know at least one of you standing is having some heart tests done this week. I know that one of you has a, a relative who's really having some health issues. I know one of you standing has been through grief with someone real close to you. And some of you are in the midst of decisions. And so, dear Father, I thank you for the privilege we have to pray together this morning. I join these Dale Wood friends today in prayer, asking you to do what only you can do. Lord, great things are what you're about. Blessed assurance, Jesus is ours. We have that assurance. And so right now, pastor and people, pray together. And I pray that in each of these situations, your will will be done. Thank you for the assurance of that in your name. You may be seated as we continue in prayer. Father, now all of us join together as a congregation. We pray for one another. We pray for the next steps that we're in the midst of taking. Father, you know about where our congregation is right now, and you know what to do for us in the coming days so that we can be all that you want us to be. Father, we ask today that you will give each of us a message. Thank you that we receive messages through worship, through prayer, through giving, through opening your word and hearing what you have to say to us. And I pray that all of these elements of worship will be ways, Heavenly Father, that you communicate with us today. Lord, I'm grateful that you know each of us by name gathered here. You know our needs. You know what we're dealing with. You know about our families. and You know about our finances. And you know everything about our future. And thank you that we can bring it all to you. And we do that just now. Father, we ask you to forgive us of our sins. We, we know that we're sinners. The Bible teaches us that, but our own experience shows it too. And Lord, we pray that you'll cleanse us Thank you, Jesus, that on the cross you paid for our debt of sin and what a debt we owe to you. We praise you and thank you for that. Father, our area needs you. Our city needs you. Our, our state, our country, our world. We're in desperate need. And Lord, we pray that we will look to you our great God, that we will find in you and in your presence such an amazement that we just stand amazed. We pray all this with thanksgiving in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Continue, Mark and Stephanie. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. And how marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sin and my sorrows. He took my sins and my sorrows and made them his very own. 
and bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. King, how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. And with, with the ransom and glory, when with the ransom and glory, his face I shall see. It will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Singing how marvelous, how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for me sing it one more time singing how marvelous how wonderful and my song shall ever be how marvelous how wonderful is my Savior's love for Let us pray. Our glorious and kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. We pray for the service to come, that Brother Mike will give us a lesson that will truly understand about you, Jesus. Uh, we pray for the service that someone that doesn't know you will come forward and come, and Brother Mike can get with him and let you know all about you. Jesus dying on the cross. We pray for these tithes and offerings. We thank you for our many blessings, and may these offerings be used to further your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen. Love search the world but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade, were never enough. And you came along. You put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all you still call me friend cause the God of the mountain 
He's the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Well, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you oh there's nothing nothing is better than you you turn morning to dancing you give beauty to ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn mourning to dancing you give beauty to ashes you turn shame into glory you're the only one who can you turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into mummies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. And all the people of God said, Amen. Nothing better than our great God. And thank you, Mark and Steffi, for reminding us of that today and leading us in worshiping Him. And today we turn back to Nehemiah. You remember that we've been through a series recently in the book of Acts. And uh, when I first came, we started in Nehemiah uh, through the first three chapters this series uh, rebuilding because that's exactly what Nehemiah is about. If you remember, Nehemiah chapter 1 is what might be called a visionary plan. Nehemiah was taken captive into Persia and in the capital city of Persia he was the king's cup bearer and he found out in a report that his hometown Jerusalem was in disrepair, the wall was broken down, the gates were burned and he had a visionary plan. God put in mind a rebuilding plan. And that's chapter 1. And then he had a vigilant purpose because out of that plan, he asked the king to allow him to leave Persia and go back to Jerusalem and begin to build. And the Bible says in chapter 2, the people had a mind to work and they began rebuilding. And then chapter 3 sort of begins the rest of the book. I call it, a victorious particip participation. All of the people gathered together and they began to rebuild. And chapter 3 is about the walls and the gates and how all of that uh, works together. And then in chapter 4, that victorious 
participation continues as we see teamwork, remember? T-E-A-M, together everyone accomplishes more, the first part of Nehemiah chapter 4. But then we pick up in Nehemiah 4, beginning with verse 16, our text uh, for this morning, Nehemiah 4 verse 16. By the way, before we stand and read that together, uh, Y-A-C, Yak. You know about Yak? Well, here's an article that was uh, in a, a Irving, Texas uh, paper. Emmett Smith cut left, saw a hole, and plunged ahead. When an arm smacked him, his legs sent him stumbling. Smith put out his right hand to keep his balance and rumbled on for 11-yard gain and the NFL career rushing record as well. With that fourth quarter run back October the 27th years ago, the Dallas Cowboys running back reached 16,728 yards, passing the late Walter Payton to become the number one on the all-time list, accomplishing a goal he set for himself at the beginning of his rookie season. Also, you might not have caught it, but in that story was a well-known NFL statistic called Y-A-C, yak. That phrase was coined years ago by John Madden, a former player and coach himself, and later a network analyst, and yak means yards after contact. Now, today in some vernacular, it's also used yards after catch, but I love the idea of yards after contact. Contact. It's not as publicized as much, but it's really one of the measures of a great running back. How, after getting hit, do they continue on and get yards? How many yards after contact? So I got a question for you this morning. How about your yak? Yards after contact. I mean, how is your yak ability? What happens after you get hit? Do you just fall down and lie there? Or do you spin around and brace yourself and keep running? What do you do when you're hit by criticism or temptation or adversity? Let's look at the Bible about one guy who scored high in yakability. His name is Nehemiah. And let's read from Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning with verse 16. Would you stand with me, please, as we read the rest of chapter 4? And it came to pass that half of my servants wrought in this work, and the other half of them held both spears and shields and bows and habergeons, which means a, a, a vest of, of steel, uh, uh, like uh, the Bible talks about a breastplate, the armor work, and with and uh, uh, they all, and they were all, be, and and behind them were all the house of Judah, and that which was builded on, and they which builded on the wall, and that which was builded, uh, every one had on his every one with one hand, he wrought in the work, and with the other hand he held his weapon, for the builders, every one had a sword girded and builded. And he, the trumpet was by me, Nehemiah speaking himself. And I said to the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, that the work is great and large, and we're separated upon the wall, one from another. In what place, therefore, you hear the sound of the trumpet, resort ye thither unto us, for our God shall fight for us. So, in the work, half of them held spears from the rising of the morning sun till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, I said to the people, let every one with servant, let everyone with his servant lodge in Jerusalem, that, it, that in the night they may be a guard to us and labor on in the day. So neither I nor my brethren 
servants. Us off our clothes, except saving that every washing. I think I'm facing and going a little bit when I'm reading the scripture. Okay, I may just grab this wireless and uh, do it that way. The battery may be going out on my. You may be seated, by the way. Sir? Oh, that would be great because I do have some props. So we're going to see how that works. It's going to work great. Okay. Thank you, Mark. You're the. One, two, three, four, five, six, nope. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. You got it now? <laughs> okay. All right. And I guess you've got the wireless thing turned off, so. Okay. Good. Let's see. Where was I? <laughs> uh, hey, uh, you know, right now, one of the things that we're looking at is this matter of uh, what that scripture said. And that scripture said something about the sword and the trowel. The sword and the trowel. Essentially, what Nehemiah said to the people is this. Okay, we're, we've got a job ahead of us that's too big for us to do. But we've got, God has called us to do it. We've got a commission. We've got a mission. We've got a word from God. So let's do it this way. Let's be workers and fighters. Let's take the sword and the trowel. And I've got both of those here today. Thanks to Merrill for the sword. Uh, so we think about a sword and somebody says, Brother Mike, you're going to start talking with us about violence and uh, all that kind of stuff with everything going on? Well, yes, in a way I am because I'm going to be talking to you about spiritual warfare. And we're going to talk about how to use the sword in spiritual warfare. But then also... Thanks to Steve, I've got a trowel today. Now, I think, ladies and gentlemen, you know what a trowel is. It's used in building, and you use it to smooth out the cement or the mortar that goes in between the bricks, and you smooth it out and cut and all the other things, chop off the ends of bricks and so forth with it. It's a tool for working. So you've got a sword for fighting, and you've got a tool for working the sword, and the trowel. Years ago, do you all know the name Charles Haddon Spurgeon? That's a name you ought to know, and if you don't know that name, he's probably one of the greatest Baptist preachers who ever lived. In the mid-1800s, uh, on up to the late 1800s, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was the pastor of the London Tabernacle, a huge church at that time. He, he wrote multitudes of books, his sermons were printed in the London Daily Times the next week after he had preached them on Sunday, and thousands of people uh, read them there. But he went from a small congregation to a larger, to a larger, to the huge Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, one of the largest Baptist churches of all time. And during a period of nearly 50 years, he preached the gospel with power and might. Early in his ministry, he started a magazine that went out once a month called The Sword and the Trowel. And in that magazine, The Sword and the Trowel, on the front page it said, a record of combat with sin and labor for the Lord. And then it had two verses underneath that. Well, the two verses were two of the verses we just read from Nehemiah chapter 4 verses 15 and 16, the story of the sword and the trowel. So uh, today, let's just think about this a little bit. Why, why a sword? Why is he saying to the people, hey, buckle on your sword and pick up your trowel? But why would there be the sword? And of course, the answer is found in Scripture, in Ephesians chapter 6, 
The Apostle Paul talks about us putting on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. And he says, you know, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the boots of good news. Put on the steel helmet of salvation. He tells all of the different six articles that we wear in combat. And he closes out by saying, and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of Spirit which is the Word of God. So when we're talking about a sword today, what, what are we talking about? We're talking about the, the weapon of offense. All the other parts of the armor of the Lord are defensive parts. But the sword is an offensive weapon. And so, you know, we have all those things that help protect us from Satan and his tricks and his darts that he shoots at us and so forth thoughts and temptations and actions and attitudes that we ought not to have that he tries to get us to have all of those are defensive weapons the shield of faith that we take the breastplate of righteousness the belt of truth the good news shoes but then the one weapon of the offense is the word of God the Bible how are you doing with the weapon of offense I mean by that how are you in Memorizing the scripture, in reading the scripture on a consistent basis, in studying the scripture, in researching the scripture. I was in ROTC in college, Reserved Officers Training Corps, and you know how far back that goes. Our weapon of offense was the M1 rifle. We all were assigned an M1 rifle. We went over to the campus armory and we were given our M1 rifle. We were taught that if it was a complete blackout, we would need to be able to find our way to the armory, get inside the armory, find our weapon, the M1 rifle, be able to take it totally apart if it were in the dark, put it totally back together, and have it ready for firing in case of an enemy attack. And so I learned about the M1 rifle the weapon of offense that in those days our army used. We had other weapons too, but that the army on foot used the M1 rifle. Well, the M1 rifle then was about like the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit today. You need to know it. Do you know it well enough if somebody comes and knocks on your door and they say, did you know the Bible says so and so and so and so and so? And so? Would you be able to say, well, maybe the Bible does say that, but it also says, you know, how... How, if, if somebody's arguing with you about the truth of the scripture, how well are you doing? That's why Nehemiah said, okay, buckle up your sword and also take the tool for work. The sword for fighting and the tool for working. So that's why we have a, a sword and that's why he said, you know, have it at your side, but also take the tool for working. Now, what is the tool for working? Well, excuse me. What is a tool for working? The tool for working is a, a, a trowel. Uh, the Bible does not specifically say trowel, but it says have the tool beside you to use for rebuilding the wall. So why is there a trowel? Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 is a great verse to remind us of why we have a trowel in the work that we do. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. A clear word from the Apostle Paul about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only do we do battle for the Lord, but we serve Him. Chapter 9, verse 8 says these words. And God is able also to make all grace abound toward you, that you, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound in every good work. God has not only equipped us, to battle with Satan, he has equipped us to do the work of the Lord. Every one of us here is equipped to handle Satan, and we're equipped to handle the service that the Lord has called us to. You know, in Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul lists some tools that the Holy Spirit gives to us. I think most of you know there are seven motivational gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to us for the church to do the work of the kingdom. Now, throughout the New Testament, there are other gifts that are given. 
But these seven motivational gifts, someone has said, they are the, they are the hot button in every Christian. They are what cause, causes us to serve the Lord and gives us the power to serve the Lord. The Holy Spirit gives us those gifts. You know, they are, number one, the gift of prophecy. Now, a better word maybe for us in 2023 than prophecy might be perception. The gift of the prophet is the gift of being able to perceive when something's not right, when something's sinful, when something needs to be called out. A, a, a word from God to reveal the truth, and a prophet is a, is a spokesman for God, a spokesman for the word. So we have people in the church who are prophets. They're not all men. They're not all women. They are young people as well who've been given discernment and perception to be able to recognize when sin is being committed and to do something about it and to speak against it. Was Billy Graham a prophet? Certainly he was. Are there, was Charles Stanley a prophet? Certainly he was. But was that his major gift, either one of them? I don't know that, but I do know a prophet is a spokesman for God who discerns our perceived sin and points that out, the gift of prophecy. Then there's also the gift of serving, the Bible says in Romans chapter 12. The gift of serving means that's a gift that somebody has that's just, uh, they, they, they just take on the work. They are able to do it. God has gifted them to serve him with their hands or with their minds or they serve at a computer or they serve at a sink or they serve somewhere else but with that gift of serving. The third gift is the gift of teaching. We have people in our churches who have been given the gift of teaching. When I was growing up, I had a Sunday school teacher who didn't have the gift of teaching. He just didn't have it. I guess somebody approached him from the nominating committee and said, listen, we got to have somebody teach those boys. Uh, will you take that boys' class? And I remember all year long that he was in there, we would, uh, we would be studying the scripture and we'd come to a hard passage, and here's what he'd say. Now, boys, that, that text just explains itself. And then he'd go on to the next text. You know, that, that was sort of his, his answer. He did not have the gift of teaching. Now, a, a lot of times people will take on a class or take on a job because the church asked them to do it, and they don't have to have the spiritual gift to do it. But you recognize when you're sitting under somebody who has the gift, the spiritual gift of teaching, and God has given them that gift. It's a spiritual gift. It's, it's a tool that they use to build up the kingdom and the work of the kingdom. Then there's also, the Bible calls it the gift of exhortation. A better word for that is the gift of encouragement, or a word in our language today. There are people with just the gift of encouragement. You're just sort of stumbling along, and they come along beside you, and they encourage you. They exhort you. You know, you see the rowers in a boat, and you see the guy at the back of the boat with his megaphone, and he's exhorting them. He's encouraging them. Keep on, keep on, keep it on. That's the gift of exhortation. And then there's the gift of giving. The gift of giving is not somebody necessarily who's rich. They may be. But the gift of giving is being able to see a need and meet that need through some kind of giving. Usually somebody who has the gift of giving they want to know that what they give to really goes to that. They don't necessarily have to be recognized. They're not looking for name calling or anything like that. But they're wanting to be sure that the gift that they give is used for the purpose for which they gave it. And the gift of giving, some people definitely have that. Then there's the gift of ruling. It says in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 12. And, and, and ruling means leading, a leadership gift. Somebody able to lead people and cause them to fulfill their mission as, as a church, the leading. And then the final gift, the seventh gift, is the gift of showing mercy. Now, I don't think that's at the end of the list because it's the least of the gifts. Uh, I think is every gift is essential, and you have to have every gift for the church to function well. Now, are those the only gifts? No, there are other gifts. But are those the only motivational gifts? They are. They're the basic gifts, that, and that means that every one of you sitting out here 
has one of those seven gifts, at least one. I had a friend of mine who used to say he had all seven gifts. I didn't believe him, and I don't believe him to this day either. I don't think anybody has all seven of those gifts. I, I know, have you ever taken a spiritual gift inventory or a spiritual gift uh, test? Uh, probably you have in this church or some other church, or maybe you've gone online. If you haven't, I encourage you to go online, type in Google the seven motivational gifts. There will be some tests available for you to take, kind of to, to see. Probably right now you're thinking, well, there's one of those that uh, sort of I is me. Is it the gift of perception? Is it the gift of serving? Is it the gift of teaching? Is it the gift of encouraging? Is it the gift of giving? Are leading, are showing mercy. Got a confession for you. Through the years since I've been in ministry, I've taken a bunch of those spiritual gifts uh, tests. I've always wanted to be the prophet, uh, you know, that just stands boldly and proclaims the word of God. I, 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 I wouldn't mind being the, the serv serving person who's just willing to serve in any place or the teacher who just wows people with research and the truth, or I'd like to be the encourager who comes along and motivates people, or I'd like to have the gift of giving or the gift of leading. Every test I take comes up pretty much the same. The gift of showing mercy. That's the one that just kind of seems to be my motivational gift. Sometimes I even try to tweak some of those answers to make them come out that it's one of the other gifts, but it's usually the gift of showing mercy. But you know, here's the thing. God calls each of us to use that spiritual gift that he gave us for the building up of the body. And here today, I guarantee you, even though we're not the large congregation we once were years ago, I guarantee you these seven gifts are manifested in this group right here today. You have one of these that sort of motivates you. If you're not sure about it, read Romans chapter 12. Read that passage where it spe specifies about those verses, begins about verse 4 and goes through verse 10 to specify that. So we've got a trowel, we've got a sword, a sword to fight sin and Satan, a trowel to work the work of the kingdom. And we're to use both like the people of Nehemiah did. And so that brings me to kind of conclude with this. Out of these last verses that we looked at today, there are sort of three enduring truths, three uh, encouraging truths today, and here they are. Number one, there is some place worth the work. You remember what uh, Nehemiah said? He said, listen, Jerusalem is in a mess. It's in reproach. We need to do something. And he's essentially saying in the rest of the book, there is a place that is worth the work. Jerusalem. Well, what is our Jerusalem? You might say, well, we were talking about Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. So our Jerusalem is, is right here, our, our place. Yes, but it's more specifically than that. You know what your Jerusalem is? Dalewood Baptist Church or the church that you're a member of. We have people from other churches today. That's, that's your Jerusalem. That's a place worth the work. You remember the story of Nicodem uh, uh, Zacchaeus in the Bible, Zacchaeus? You know, he was that little man that climbed up in the sycamore tree to see Jesus passing by. He was too short, and he couldn't jump and see above the crowd, so he's leaning out from this tree limb, and Jesus spots him and says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. Zacchaeus got saved that day. He never was the same anymore. You know, he was a tax collector, cheated and uh, stole and other things like that, he became a changed man and said, anybody I've ever done wrong to, I'm going to make it right. Jesus saved him that day. Well, there's a legend about Zacchaeus. It's not in the scriptures, a legend. It says that uh, after he met Jesus, one day he left to go to work, and he took a watering can and a hoe with him to work. Well, he didn't do gardening work. He was a tax collector. He, he did different kind of work. And so his wife wondered, why is he taking that hoe and that, that uh, watering can with him today? So he came back from work that day, and next day he left for work and took a watering can and a hoe again. Well, she got so curious, one day she followed him to the table where he worked, 
and saw that he stopped on the way at a tree, a sycamore tree. And he hoed around it, and he watered it. You know why he was so interested in that sycamore tree thriving and growing? Because that's where he had met Jesus. That's where his life began to change. That's where he was transformed, and he loved that spot. It was sacred to him. It required work. Well, our church is a sacred spot. It's where many of us met Jesus. It's where many of us learn to grow in Christ and share our faith, be filled with the Spirit, learn about the Word of God. So naturally, we're interested. It's a work that is worth it because it's such a wonderful place to us. But the second thing this morning that we need to leave with is there's some things that's worth the war. I couldn't, couldn't say that word. There's some thing that's worth the war. What we mean by that is if something is worth the work, it's our church. What is it that's worth the war? You remember earlier Nehemiah had said to all the people, listen, Sanballat, Satan, and Tobiah, and all of that team of enemies, the demons, that's really who is described in the book of Nehemiah, Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem and uh, so forth, the evil trinity that would come against the church. He said, listen, fight against the enemies for your families, for your wives, for your sons, for your daughters, for your homes. What was Nehemiah saying to them? There is something that's worth the war. And so we not only take the trowel to work for some place that's worth the work, we take the sword, the word of God, which helps us in the fight that would destroy our family. Do you all agree with me this morning? Satan is against the family. Just about every headline we read, just about every news event that we hear is some kind of attack against the biblical concept of family. Husbands, wives, children, boys, girls, growing up in the likeness and in the nurture of the Lord. And so, y'all, we have a reason to fight the fight. Not to be violent, not to hurt somebody else. We do not fight against flesh and blood, the scripture says, but against powers and principalities and those who would wreck our homes, our schools, our families, our parenting, our children growing up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Those are things that are worth the fight, worth the war. So there is something that's worth the work and there's something that's worth the war. And then finally this morning, there is someone who is worth the wait. Someone who is worth the wait. The Bible says that Nehemiah was right there where they were. And then he says, if we, if we need each other, if a crisis develops, I've got the trumpet player right here, and he will sound the horn, and everybody come with your swords and with your trowels and come to that spot where it's needed. And there was Nehemiah in the midst of them. In fact, it says, I didn't even take my clothes off except to wash them during the whole time. And I called on all the people to do the same thing. We're defending our families. We're defending our homes. We're defending our faith. So let's just keep at it. But right there in the midst of them was Nehemiah. And I would say to you, Nehemiah is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's worth the wait. You know, sometimes people say, man, I get so tired in this spiritual warfare. I get so tired in the work of the kingdom. I just get so tired. But one of these days, our captain's going to return. One of these days, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back, and he's going to redeem his own. His church is going to be caught up with him in the clouds to meet him in the air. And then there's going to be this awful time of tribulation here on this earth. And then at the end of that, the king is coming, and he will come back again, bringing us with him to be reigning here on this earth again. And I, that's, that's worth the wait. It's worth waiting on him because we know that he is coming. And even like the trumpet would be sounded for everybody to come, the trumpet will sound and the dead in Christ will rise. And that's going to be a glorious time together. 
And it's worth it to think about hearing him say to each of you and to me, well done, good and faithful soldier. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've taken the tools that I've given to you. You've taken the sword that I've given to you. You've used the sword against the enemy, and you've used the tools for the work. And God is blessing you, and God is using you. So, I'm saying to you today, how's your yak ability? Have you gotten hit by anything lately? Sickness, illness, difficulty, financial trouble, relationship problems? Have you got hit by criticism? Have you got hit by other kinds of things that can hit us? Got good news for you. You can keep going. You can be a person that gets lots of yards after contact in the work and in the battle. And may we do it till Jesus comes. Amen? Bow with me, please, as we pray together. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Well, Lord, I guess as many things as could go wrong went wrong here this morning in the way of technical stuff. I know part of the reason for that is that Satan would like for this scripture not to get into hearts of people, this message not to be made clear. Lord, we, we know that's the work of Satan. And so we come against that today, testifying that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And the one who is in us is the one, Lord Jesus Christ, who is able to overcome and help us be more than conquerors through his name. So, Father, thank you that you've equipped all of us with the trowel, a gift of the Holy Spirit to do the work of the kingdom. And you've equipped all of us with a sword, the word of God, to use against Satan. Lord Jesus, thank you that as you began your public ministry, you were tempted in every way like we are, and yet without sin. And Satan came against you with great, powerful temptations. And thank you that every time you answered him with the word of God. Help us to know God's word so that we can answer Satan in our time of temptation. Help us to memorize it and learn it and know it so that we can use it as a weapon of offense against the tempter. And thank you that you've given us a tool for work and for service and help us to use that tool, the gift of the Spirit, whichever one that you've given us. Thank you that we're not jealous about other people's gifts. It doesn't create division, it creates unity that we all together can enter into the work. Thank you, Lord, that on Nehemiah's wall were families older men and women, leaders in the community. Thank you that there were husbands and wives. Thank you that there were daughters and sons, grandsons and granddaughters, all about the work of rebuilding the walls. Thank you, Lord, that you use each one of us, that there's not one of us that does not have a gift, and there's not one of us that cannot use the sword in this work, and this warfare that you've called us to enter into. So, Father, may we, the church of Jesus Christ, arise. And may we enter into the work as never before and into the warfare as never before. Your army, your company, working and warring for Christ. Heads are still bowed just for a moment. Eyes are still closed. We're going to sing this morning a, a song that I think you know is a favorite of mine. We, we sang it a couple of times earlier on when I was dealing with the series in spiritual warfare. And it simply says that the church is to arise and put our armor on and that in the name of Christ our captain to go forth. And I'd like for us to sing it this morning if it's you have kind of forgotten the tune or the words, they'll be up here on this screen on my right. And uh, let, Let's sing it as a congregation this morning. If, if during the singing of it, there's a response that you feel a need to give today, come forward and share it with me. If you'd like to 
kind of re-enlist in God's army, this would be a great time to do it. If today God has spoken to you and you're uh, not sure about being in God's army, in God's workforce, maybe you just kind of fell in line, but was there a time you really enlisted? Do you look back and remember when you came into being part of God's family, one of his disciples? Was there a time when you prayed, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need forgiveness and I receive you into my life and thank you that you died on the cross and rose again for me and I want to be a part of what you're doing. If that has happened, then praise the Lord for that. But if you're not sure about that, this would be a great time to re-up, to re-enlist in, in God's workforce, in God's army. Or maybe today there's another response that you feel led to give. I'll be down at the front, and while uh, Mark and Steffi are leading us and we're singing this song, it would be fine for you to step out and, and make a response. Maybe you're feeling the need to join this church. We'd love to have you. Maybe you're feeling the need to make a public commitment that you've made in your heart, but you haven't done so yet. We'd rejoice in it. Maybe there's just something you'd like to mention to me that God is doing in your life, I'll be glad to pray with you about it. Father, we pray now that during this time of invitation, we will respond as the Spirit of God leads us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. Mark, Steffi. Oh, yes, you don't need that back. Okay. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. The shield of faith and belt of truth We'll stand against the devil's lie An army bold with the battle cry Reaching out to those in darkness Our call to war To love the captive soul but to rage against the captor and with the sword that makes the wounded whole we will fight with faith and valor when faced with trials on every side we know the outcome is secure and Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken, and they his foes lie crushed beneath his feet. For the conqueror has risen And as the stone was rolled away And Christ emerges from his grave This victory march continues to the day Every eye and heart shall see him Spirit come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run 
with faith and win the prize of a servant good and faithful as saints of old still line the way retelling triumphs of his grace when heaven open the when the day when Christ will stand in glory. Amen. Y'all may be seated just for a minute. So good to be together today and remember that each, every one of us is gifted for the work and we are equipped for the war. We're not going to have to be defeated by Satan. And one day the captain's going to come and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. So be it. Remember that two weeks from today, there will be a call business meeting at the end of church to uh, take on this matter of the bid on the uh, pastorium, the Walton House uh, over on the other property, and praying... Uh, for God to use that for His glory. That's what we're wanting. Uh, remember that we have prayer meeting on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock, and we're continuing that. I asked the group this last week, uh, now that we've got daylight hours, do you want to move to a later time in the day? And everybody's able to do that. I, I will say this. If there's any one of you, or if you know anyone in this condition, who would be at prayer service if the time were different because of your schedule, uh, you just can't do it, then let us know and we'll we'll try to deal with that and see uh, what can happen. But right now, we're, that room is full on Wednesdays at 11 and it's a great, exciting uh, time for uh, prayer service. Remember that next Sunday, I'll be gone. Uh, I'm baptizing my our youngest grandson next Sunday at First Baptist in Goodlitzville and a uh, very exciting thing. And guess who's preaching for us? Jonathan Gunther will preach next Sunday. So Mark is going to be back to do our worship music, and uh, Jonathan's going to bring a message that God's been putting on his heart for some time, and I believe it will be a word from him that uh, will be a blessing to you. So be sure and be here. Thanks for your prayers as I go and do that wonderful, blessed uh, privilege. of. Uh, I had the opportunity several months ago, a couple of months ago, of sitting down in the house with Luke and just sharing the gospel with him. He had talked with his folks and had uh, kind of prayed, but I wanted to be sure it was absolutely clear about him being a sinner, his need to be forgiven and cleansed and have Jesus as his Savior. And we prayed together and it was a sweet time and now he's getting baptized. And the pastor there at Goodlitzville uh, asked me if, if I'd come as his grandpa and uh, baptize him next Sunday. So that's going to be a special time. Thank you for uh, praying for that. You know, today I, I really believe the Lord is uh, working in a very significant way at Dale Wood. I don't know exactly what's next, but I know God is there, and He's in the midst of it. Apparently, there's this partnership that uh, is being proposed to us uh, from Brentwood Baptist, and it's going to be something very significant. As soon as we get from them the covenant relationship, the agreement, we will let all of you as a congregation, everybody in the congregation, know that, and then we'll have an opportunity after that to announce a call business meeting, or it might be right at the time of a business meeting, but we'll let you know when that, that covenant that you will have had the opportunity to read and so forth uh, is, is voted on by our congregation. That their trustees and officers in the, uh, in the group that does these uh, partnerships uh, they would have agreed on a, uh, a covenant, and we, we see if that's where we feel like God is leading us. So we as a congregation will have that opportunity. Thank you for being here today. It's good to see you. Uh, Mark, thank you for coming today. Steffi, good to see you back. And uh, each of you, feel free to greet each other before you leave. And, you know, one of the things that happens is we have folks that break down the chairs and move them out of the way. We do have another congregation that comes in in the afternoon. But they have a different, a uh, little bit of a different setup. This staging that's only been here for two weeks is uh, a gift from them, and we're very uh, thankful for that. 
I think, think you might have noticed that those old decaying planters, wooden planters that were rotting and so forth, they're gone. We've got new uh, fresh flowers out there. Again, that's a uh, contribution from uh, Awaken also. And uh, so it's, it's good that we're partnering together uh, in that ministry. Let's stand together. Mark, you lead us in our closing song, and I'll give you your microphone back. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captain and break every chain, oh God. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God. You have done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain, oh 